people a chance to get here. So I'm Steve Preskill, and with Kevin Ferreira, we organize the, the social justice dialogues that we've been having all semester. A number of you have been to quite a few of them. Um, this is the second to last one. I think we'll be having one at the end of April. With these social justice dialogues, we, uh, we're trying to bring people together into a safe space to dialogue in a, in a very collaborative and mutually supportive way. And we've got, a, we've got a, uh, a set of guidelines that we like to read each time. And I'm, I'm not going to make an exception for this session, so bear with us here. We say that the social justice dialogue lunches are a safe place for the Wagner community, including students, faculty, and staff, to come together to exchange varying viewpoints across differences on timely and challenging issues. These moderated discussions encourage mutual respect, close and sympathetic listening, diverse perspectives, suspended judgment, and individual reflection. Our guidelines include, as we've said, mutual respect. Listening is as important as talking. Remaining open to different perspectives, talking to each other, not the moderator, Everyone being encouraged to participate, not dominate. This is a discussion, not a debate. It's deliberative, not argumentative. When disagreement occurs, keep talking. Explore the disagreement, but search for common ground. And ask clarifying questions. Help to develop each other's ideas. So those are our guidelines, which we try to practice. We're very fortunate today to have with us Lonnie Brandon and Tony Whitlock both of whom participated, both of whom were part of Black Concern. Bonnie was president of, of, of the Black Concern organization and were part of the protests that occurred in April of 1970 here about Wagner's failure at that time to be more responsive, more forthcoming around issues relating to diversity, to minority perspectives, to having underrepresented students and faculty here and of course They'll say much more about that, but they'll both have a chance to share with us their experiences. So they're here to speak to us. Lily McNair, our provost, is also here to give us a kind of contemporary perspective on our ongoing challenges around diversity, the progress we've made, but also the, the things we still need to do to, to move forward. So the other thing we always do with the social justice dialogues before we actually get started and turn things over uh, to Mr. Brandon and Ms. Whitlock is we go around the circle and just find out what's brought you here, what's your connection to this discussion. So I'm going to start with you and we'll go from there. My name is Martha, and I just find this stuff really interesting, so that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Excuse me. <laughs> um, Hello everybody, my name is Amanda Graham, and sorry, excuse me, for I took a bite before the mm -hmm. evening, because I need food. But um, I'm a junior here at Rackham College. Um, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm really interested in stuff like that, and I'm, I feel as though um, I am one of the leaders on campus who actually uh, voices my opinion and not afraid to voice my opinion and um, kind of pinpoint the weak points and also strong points that Wagner has for the black community. So. Thank you. Yeah, My name is Laura Barlamin. I work for the Office of Communications and I'm the alumni magazine editor. This is an alumni story that I would like to cover more you know, in depth someday in the Wagner magazine. We just had a little bit about it when you did the previous program, mm -hmm. but I think it's a really good talk of Wagner history. And so that's why I'm here. Yeah. My name is Usman Traore. I'm, I'm here representing the uh, history department. And because the history department is well involved in this, mm -hmm. this discussion. And so also I'm interested in participating to this uh, debate also. Um, because I'm teaching um, global colonialism and uh, imperialism from a global perspective. And the consequences of the uh, World War One, World War Two, the consequences of like, high imperialism, and we, with my students, we uh, we go over many many topics related to genocide, to social racism, scientific racism. So, and I think 
you know, fast credit is this kind of um, is this kind of, kind of um, um, event. Like, most, I can learn something to share probably with my students in class. So, so right here. So. I'm Anne Love, I'm Associate Provost for Assessment, and I have enjoyed these dialogues because it is a place where we get to come together across different communities at Wagner and share some ideas. Hello, I'm Tony Whitlock. I was Tony King when I was a member of Black Concern, and uh, Lonnie invited me after all these years. I, I stayed through the um, first two years, the beginning of my junior year, I was so disillusioned by everything that had happened, the successes and then the failures, and uh, I left and I didn't even go back to school for a long time, and then I ended up finishing at Adelphi in Garden City, and then I went on to get my master's in Montclair. Um, it's nice to hear that you're interested in what happened so many years ago. I mean, I'm 60 now and I was 16 when I came here as a freshman, so it's ironic that you are interested in our stories, and I'm glad to hear that you are about looking back, looking at the present, and looking forward, um, because that's what we all have to do, whatever our setting is, to, you know, be the best that we can be. So I'm delighted to be here, and I look forward to the discussion. And I'm Lonnie Brandon, and I came to Wagner in 1968, and uh, when I arrived here on campus, there were about 15 upper-class African-American students, and there were about 50 in my class. So uh, we basically tripled our numbers in, uh, with one class. and. Uh, there was quite a bit of backlash uh, socially. Um, a lot of the students that were here uh, felt they were being invaded. Um, and we never really felt a part of the campus while we were here uh, in those early days. And uh, I was an athlete. I was here on a football scholarship. and. Even my teammates were very distant. You know, uh, there were a few that were friendly, and uh, we managed to uh, create some, some long-lasting relationships. But uh, for the most part, it was uh, a very tumultuous time. Uh, you know, it was right at sort of the end of the, the whole civil rights movement, um, and it, things that had expanded. Uh, socially uh, with uh, SDS and uh, a lot of the movements that were going on uh, protesting the war in Vietnam and uh, <clears throat> that whole uh, attitude of protest I guess probably is what inspired us to to seek the things that uh, we thought that would make Wagner College uh, a more inclusive environment and we uh, developed a list of the demands that we submitted to the administration or improvements that we thought that were interesting. But I'm going too far. You haven't introduced yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great place to, to leave yeah. off. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a little cliffhanger. Yeah. 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 I'm Amy Eshelman. I'm a faculty member in the psychology okay. department. And like many others have said, I'm, I'm interested in getting to know student leaders. I'm interested uh, for, I have academic interests in prejudice and discrimination. Um, and, and I think you know, just some of what you said was so fascinating because today, prejudice and discrimination tend to be very subtle. And it sounds like you, know, you were really at a moment where it was very upfront and very overt. Um, but uh, I'm on sabbatical this semester, and so I'm sort of itching for intellectual discussion. So when Kevin <laughs> said, come to this, I was like, okay, that's a good idea. And so I'm here. Okay. I'm Lee Manchester, enough set. But you've been very involved with mm -hmm. this issue and helped us to remember it in a lot of important ways, once again, helping to be an institutional memory. I, I just have to say that, Lee. Well, thank yeah, you. I agree. But, uh, Steve, uh, Kevin asked me to, Kevin actually asked me to put 
this program on. And knowing knowing Lonnie, Lonnie is Lonnie became one of my heroes when I when I got to know him during the when when you were organizing the the 2010 symposium. Um, I, I I came to I developed an enormous amount of respect for what for what you guys did the the sac and the sacrifice that you made uh, to make better a college that clearly didn't really care a whole lot about you at that time uh, and then you took the trouble thirty years later to come back after what had happened and take yet another step. 40. 40, yeah. <laughs> another step to make to make Wagner College better. Uh, I can't tell you how, how much I respect you and Tony and, and what you all did for for this community and what you continue to do. I'm really glad that you're a part of a part of the college today. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a deep interest in the civil rights movement and what we can learn about leadership and about creating a better society from studying it. But I also have to mention, I mean, Lee Manchester also got me excited about what happened in 1970. But again, Lori Weintraub, it was when I taught with her where I first learned about these events and first began to get connected to it in some way. So I'm just really happy to be here and to have the chance to learn more. I'm Lily McNair. And as is the case for everyone in this room, we're all very much interested and committed to exploring these types of issues. And I know for myself, addressing diversity on college campuses has been part of my life since I was a college student. I recall hearing about Wagner's history when I was at Spelman because one of my colleagues, who is now a good friend of mine, graduated from Wagner in 1988. She's an African-American woman. So that's when I first heard about black concern. I met Lonnie last year when I joined my first year at Wagner, and since then, am I, and, and continue to be very impressed by all that you've done, and continue to do, Lonnie, and learning more about the, our history here. And I'm committed to making Wagner a better place. Period. But again, especially interested in how we can be more diverse in a number of many complicated ways, and I'll talk more about that later. So back over to you, Mr. Brennan and Ms. Woodlock. Tell, tell the story. I guess I left off in 1968 at some point. But, uh, it was uh, a real period of growth for uh, a lot of us. Uh, it was the first time that we were away from home and away from our parents. Uh, and I personally had uh, participated in uh, some very similar kinds of uh, activities at my high school, uh, Montclair High School. And um, as I said earlier, that was you know just towards the tail end of the, the civil rights era and the awakening of the whole black power movement and um, and student power. I mean, students were were demonstrating uh, all over the country, uh, you know, protesting the war in Vietnam, and uh, and actually wanting to have a voice in their uh, academic environments. You know, prior to that time, it was almost you know you do as we say, you know, and not as we do. Uh, so you know, there was very little student input. Uh, I remember, uh, I was telling Tony earlier um, on the drive over, that um, when I first got here, we didn't even have uh, visitation in the dorms, co-ed visitation. I mean, it was strictly women's dorms, men's dorms, you know. And uh, that changed uh, about midway through my freshman year. And there was a, a student strike that took place uh, during 1969, 68, 69, because uh, they were going to raise the tuition ten dollars a credit, and there was a big backlash because it was going from like twenty to thirty dollars. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it was uh, a fifty percent increase, and um, we, there was a big strike that took place. Uh, 
classes were suspended for about four days or so. And um, we had all kinds of things going on and there ended up being a, a, a list of demands drawn up by the entire student body um, that got so blown out of proportion there were probably a hundred demands or close to it, you know, when it was all said and done. And uh, that kind of set the stage for the following year. Um, and when we came back uh, during my sophomore year, which would have been 69-70, uh, we began trying to organize some things on campus and uh, we started a program where we brought some kids up from the, uh, the community on Saturday mornings uh, to expose them to, to college life a little bit and we uh, tutored them and played games. Uh, and that worked for a little while. Um, that was our input, you know, giving back to the community. Um, and we got moderate support from, from the college. Um, absolutely no financial support. We raised all of the money ourselves. And, um, but then uh, we started to look at our lives here on campus and the things that we felt would be uh, more relevant for us and to, to make the campus more inclusive. And uh, we developed a list of demands sometime, uh, I guess, in early uh, 1969 and presented them to the administration. And basically what we were looking for was increased minority enrollment, uh, minority representation on faculty and in administration. Um, and those were the basic demands. Uh, there were probably three or four others that uh, were very closely related to those. But um, those were the kinds of things that we sought. And um, after we presented them to the administration, we had a few preliminary discussions. And um, at some point, the administration uh, decided that we would no longer be discussing our demands and uh, that's when we uh, decided we were going to occupy Kennard Hall, which was the heartbeat of the campus. Um, you, know, it's, you know, all of the academic records were there, uh, most of the money was there, I guess, <laughs> the, the business office was there and the bursar. Um, so we felt if we occupied that building, uh, we would get their attention. And uh, so we moved in there on a Tuesday night. And, uh, I believe it was Tuesday. Um, but we moved in there um, through an open window. That's how we gained access to the building. Uh, we flipped on all of the lights, and then the security guard came and knocked on the door and wanted to know what was going on. So we told them that we were now taking over the building. and. Uh, we took his keys, uh, and then we secured the building. We, uh, we had taken rope and uh, food and all kinds of things in there, staples that we figured we would need because we didn't know how long we would be there. And um, uh, we took masking tape and masked all of the windows in case uh, somebody decided they were going to throw rocks through the windows, the glass wouldn't shatter. Um, we tied all of the doors shut with the rope that we had, and um, we waited. Uh, the, some by during the night, because that was about 10 o'clock when we went in there. Uh, so at some point, we were uh, contacted, and we began discussing uh, what our you know goals and our demands were. Uh, and we, I believe we stayed there for about three days. Uh, during our occupation of the building, uh, we had a surprise visit from Julian Baum, who was uh, a Georgia legislator at the time. And uh, he came in um, to give us a pep talk. He had been on Staten Island uh, speaking at another school. And uh, he heard about uh, our activities, so he stopped by. Um, 
this is where the security staff got really ticked off at us because we made them climb up the fire escape to gain entrance into the building. Because uh, they wanted us to open the doors and we refused. They said not even for Julian Bond. So, uh, he came in and, and spent a few, you know, a few minutes with us and uh, really offered us some words of encouragement and told us to hang in there and you know, stay the course. Uh, and I guess probably around Thursday, uh, the administration uh, made commitments to, uh, to meet with us and to uh, recognize our, uh, our concerns and to address them. Um, and we decided that that was, you know, good enough. And so in good faith, we, we left the building uh, on Friday, I believe. And uh, what was important about that time frame was that that Saturday was the day that um, all of the pre-admitted students were supposed to come to campus to, for tours. So um, we knew they didn't want us in that building. <laughs> you know? So we, uh, we came out and um, that Saturday there was a group of uh, white students who were not affiliated with us, but they uh, disrupted the college day activities and uh, they marched around campus in and out of some of the rooms uh, where meetings were going on and uh, the administration assumed that we had instigated that demonstration on Saturday and um, on Monday morning they informed us that they were reneging on all of the commitments that they had made to get us out of the building. So at that point, um, we went to see Dean Haas, who was the dean of the college, which pretty much was like uh, Dr. McNair's position as provost, I guess, in those days. And uh, he was second in command. Uh, Dr. Davidson, who was the president, had been at Bregenz over in Austria and um, was unavailable. And uh, so we went to meet with Dean Haas. And, uh, we ended up sitting in his office for about eight hours, I guess. And uh, at some point during the occupation of Dean Haas's office, uh, the 27 students that were in there, we were expelled uh, by uh, Dean Marr. And we ultimately ended up in three different courts uh, to get back into school and uh, we Finally, our final court was uh, a federal court of appeals um, over in Brooklyn. And uh, what they basically did was to uh, instruct the, the college to uh, follow due process. Because that was one of our arguments. We had been expelled without due process. There was no hearing. Uh, and it was pretty clear in the college uh, guidelines that you know, there was a, uh, a process that needed to be followed. So we came back and the faculty council, I guess it was, held hearings and um, they reduced our expulsions to suspensions. And uh, about seven, you know, about half of the, roughly half of the students that were expelled uh, chose not to come back and uh, I was a part of the group that did come back. Uh, Ms. Whitlock here, she uh, chose not to come back, and uh, maybe she can tell you a little bit about why she did well, make her decision. Just, if it had just been um, reduced from an expulsion to a suspension, I would have stayed. But they took away 16 credits from me, and I thought, oh my goodness, I have to pay for these again, and I work for them, and how unfair. And I was very idealistic, as I said, I was very young. Um, Lonnie's sophomore year was my freshman year. I came here 16 years old, bright, bushy-tailed, so optimistic. And it seemed like um, black concern was, you know, the young intelligentsia to me. And we were so organized and so um, into doing the right thing for everyone because we felt like it was just ignorance we were finding at Wagner. A lot of us came from New York. And um, 
because as Ronnie said, those were political times and people were on another page and Staten Island was at least 10 to 20 years behind. <laughs> so it was a real culture shock for me. But we really felt like what we called demands were just reasonable suggestions because this is what schools across the country were saying. Um, the reason why people don't get along is because they're ignorant of each other. We need classes that represented all people and um, that was the big problem, ignorance. And our, the response to us seemed ignorant to me. I couldn't believe that we were punished so harshly for such a reasonable request. And I tried to hang in there. I came back from my junior year, but I was just so disgusted and I felt abused, <laughs> you know, and I didn't, I didn't have any, um, anything to keep me here anymore. I felt like it was uh, a lofty idea trying to turn Wagner around, but um, the cost was just too high and no one seemed to care. No one was saying, how unfair. And white students didn't get punished for what they did, and look how harshly you were dealt with. And, and as Lonnie pointed out, even the disruption that we were blamed for, we had nothing to do with. And Wagner was a really little campus, and it would be hard to know who did what, you know, and we stood out. So, well, how many of us? Less than 100? Yeah, there were about 83 of us. I yeah, so, I mean, I don't even understand why there was any misunderstanding about who did what. I felt like we were the scapegoats, and, oh well, you know, too bad. And that's it. And I think um, in my book club, we're talking about human trafficking. We read a novel about it. And we're talking about how all of the ills in this country just get swept aside, and no one really deals with them. They just turn their heads and go, oh, that's over. And we don't really deal with them. So it just festers. And the violence and the unfairness that continues, it just grows and grows because you don't deal with it. So. Uh, I don't know. That's the way I see what we went through. Um, I'm encouraged that students do still have those conversations and that administrators and faculty do need to discuss it because in our day that was sort of a revolutionary thought to insist that we have that discussion, let alone actually work on changing things. So in some ways I'm encouraged and in other ways I see the population's pretty much the same. But <laughs> you know, but there are other reasons for that too. So I don't know. I invite you to tell me what's been going on here because I haven't been like Lonnie keeping up with it as much. How do you see the successes in this area at Wagner? Because I think you always have to build on successes mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just attacking the ills. So tell me about your perception of how Wagner has grown and improved since my day. Because I left it at the beginning of 71. Mm -hmm. I came in 69, so it's been a long time. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a perfect opening for, for Dr. McNair to talk a little bit about some of the issues we're dealing with at, at Wagner now, and then we can open up for conversation. Is that, that sure, that, that's great. I came to Wagner 40 years after you left, Tony. And I really appreciate your and Lonnie's descriptions about your experiences here. And as I listen to them, I feel that same sense of outrage and sadness at how decisions were made and how students' voices and concerns weren't responded to in a more positive way. Because during those times, a few years after the protests, which you were engaged in, I was engaged in similar protests at other schools. And your demands, quote unquote, were are quite reasonable. Increased minority student enrollment, increased representation of minorities on faculty and administration. That's a basic, that's a given in terms of creating institutions, and especially institutions of higher education that are equitable and fair and represent all of us, not only in terms of who's here, but the kinds of ideas that are discussed, that are studies, about what's important and what's critical and necessary in providing an education that will really provide our students the means to think critically and synthesize information in a way that they can really understand these types of complex issues. Issues around diversity, and again, I use this word as a proxy because diversity is so much more than the many ways in which we think about diversity. We're really talking about a lot of intertwined and complicated issues around justice and equality. But for discussion's sake, divert, we, I think we're all on the same page. 
when we use this very broad term diversity? How can one be an educated and informed citizen without clear knowledge and understanding and ways of thinking clearly and critically about what we call diversity? We talk about living in a world that's diverse. We talk about the global experience. We've got to be able to grapple with these issues. So that's important here. I'd like to believe, and I do believe, that Wagner is a very different place now. I know that for a, for a fact. How do I know that? How do I know Wagner is a different place? I can start at the most simple level. When I came here for, an inter for my interview in, 2000, in the spring of 2011, and I stood in Spiro 2 before the faculty, well, I think the discussion went well. But when I went back home to Atlanta, where I was a, uh, a associate professor at Spelman, I had a thought in my head, an agony thought. Is Wagner ready for an African-American woman program? I can never run away from that reality. I can never hide under the presumption that the world sees me on the basis of my merits and my skills and my credibility, because the reality is I'm an African American Asian woman. So people are going to respond to me in that way. So that was part of the question in my head, is Wagner ready for an African American woman provost? Well, I'm happy to be here. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be here to provide my input in working with faculty and students and administration and staff to make Wagner a better place. And I'm not afraid to say that my commitment to increasing the diversity of this campus, not only in terms of student enrollment, not only in terms of faculty numbers, and especially in terms of diversifying the curriculum and the different ideas that are addressed here within the curriculum and on this campus is paramount. So I want to share a little bit with you about diversity at Wagner. And I asked Angelo Raymer, our VP for enrollment, to give me some, some data and some trends. And he said that in 1998, when we started the Wagner plan, we were 10% students of color, meaning African American, Latino, Latina, Asian American, Native American, and so forth. Ten years ago, we were at 14% students of color. This fall, with the, with the entering first year class, we're at 19.4% students of color overall. But our entering class, our current first year class, consists of 21% students of color. Overall on the campus, 8% of our students are African American, 7% Latino, Latina, 4-5% Native American and, and 4 to 5% Native American and Asian Pacific Islander. Now, he says that we have a number of students who don't identify. We put all them. So we, we're, we're not sure. And, and our, the undergraduate population, the young people population around the country in general is much more open to indicating other or multicultural, not choosing a box. Now, Angelo says it's important to point out for, that for small residential colleges in the north, the average percentage for students of color is 13%. So we're at a higher percentage than, than most. And our graduation and retention rates are consistently equal for students of color and non-students of color, which is important. Okay. So this gives you a sense of how we change. But remember, when we, in the 1970s, Angelo says we were about 25 to 30 percent students of color, mostly African American students. So, like Lonnie, you were part of the group that really reflected a great increase and in influx of black students. And it was a real culture shock. You know, the institution was changing very quickly, and we can't forget what that was like for students to, to come in and be part of a community, many of whom were not ready for this change in, in our community. Um, when I came to Wagner and I began to look at the landscape around me and who's who and who's where, this is what I noticed. On the Board of Trustees, there was one African American alum, Mike Kelly, he's still on the board, currently on the board. Now we've got another African American alum from the class of 1978, Lorraine McNeil Popper, who's on the board. So now we've got two African Americans on the board out of about, I don't know, I probably shouldn't say. I think we probably have about at least 25, 
20, 25, 27 people on the board. But it's clear that when we talk about the board, it's diversifying the board is a strong thing. Diversifying the board is a thing that's brought up among many members of the board. That's important. Okay? So in terms of the senior administration of the college, so the groups of administrators and the vice presidents who are charged with, with having the responsibility for helping to run the college in the most effective way. So we've got a president, we've got a provost who's African American, we have an uh, associate vice president of campus life who reports to me but is on senior staff representing campus life who is a person of color who's Asian, Ruta Shaw Gordon, who's East Indian. And until about November when Maya Garcia resigned, we had a woman of Latino background who was on the senior staff as well. Maya was VP of Institutional Advancement. So out of eight people on senior staff, last fall we had Three, three women of color who were represent, representing, representative on the senior staff. Three out of eight. That's an important shift, an important change. I know that Wagner's strong commitment to civic engagement, to the Port Richmond Partnership, to experiential learning, really reflects important values that are at our core and reflect a real appreciation of the experiences of people of color. When we talk about the Port Richmond Partnership, we are talking about working with communities of color, many of whom are Latino, Latina, Mexican immigrants, and African American. We can't run from that. That's a major change. That reflects an important way in which the curriculum of Wagner, which impacts all of our students, is strongly tied into an intense commitment to diversity. And I know that in terms of the work that I've been doing when, since I've been here, last year I say to faculty, we, we had 12 faculty searches, I may never have this many searches running at one time, but of all those 12 faculty searches I made very clear when I met with each department initiating a search, my expectation that I review with them the candidate pools and approve the people who were in the top 10 pool and the people who were brought to campus because I required that that pool be diverse and deep. I, I, I said, I need to see at least one quarter to one third of people in the top list and the people you bring to campus being people from underrepresented groups in your area. And I, I, that was a big change. That was a big change. Some departments went with that and said, we understand. Allison and Usman are here from history. I'm not ashamed, I'm not afraid of saying that the history department of Wang Wagner gets this. This history department really understands the critical importance of diversity of ideas, diversity of faculty. You guys do it well. There were some departments who weren't on the same page. And I had to explain what it meant to really search for a broad pool. I had to explain what it means. I said, you can't do things the same way and expect to bring in a more diverse pool. So out of those 12 new faculty that are hired, a third of them were people of color. Okay? People from underrepresented groups in their disciplines. This year we have only three searches ongoing and I'm pleased to say the process is getting easier. You know? People have already heard about what it means, and I talk with everybody from the beginning, they say, these are the guidelines, this is what my expectation is, so when we're starting now to bring in candidates for one position, and half the candidates that have been brought in are people of color. So that's important. So we're starting to make real changes, and changes in that direction in terms of our faculty are very critical. I'm happy to talk a little bit about two other important changes. When during Black History Month, we brought in our first Black History Month scholar, Tricia Rose from Brown University. Faculty came to me at the end of last semester and said, we want to do something substantial. We don't want to just have a Black History Month event here and there. there. We want to really change the way we talk about race and diversity at Wagner. So the group came together, nominated some, some important cutting edge speakers 
and scholars in the field and voted and Trisha Rose was number one and we brought her to campus. And she shook things up. She engaged students, uh, attention and imagination and really gave some, and, and faculty and staff. We were just, Spur 2 was full. And we, it was a, an excellent event and we're continuing those dialogues and continuing that commitment. And for those of you who don't know, our commencement speaker is going to be Marilee Everest Williams. This is a remarkable moment for Wagner to bring in a woman of her background and her just very insightful commitment to social justice, to Wagner College, to speak to us. Things are changing. We have a lot more work to do. I'm, by no means am I saying, okay, we've got three, we've had three women of color, three people of color on the leadership board. We've got a provost who's an African American woman. We're increasing the numbers of faculty and staff and students. There's so much more work to do, but I'm convinced that we're at a place now where there are there's a critical mass of people who are interested and committed to doing that hard work with me, and I know that the obstacles aren't as great as they were 40 years ago. I wouldn't be here right now if Wagner weren't a place who was open to inclusivity and diversity. And I wouldn't still, and even if I came two years ago, I wouldn't still be here if were it not for the fact that some of the things that I've said and done are being, uh, are, are accepted and are acceptable in terms of the changes and, and my vision for enhancing and increasing diversity and inclusiveness on this campus. So I look forward to hearing from the group, you know, as Tony said, I look forward to us having a discussion about moving forward. Where, where have we been, where we are now, and where do we go forward? Because you're all right, there's so much more to do. Wow, are we lucky to have you here. Um, <laughs> So, Mr. Brandon and Ms. Whitlock, the people, Curtis Wright is our Dean of Campus Life and Leadership. And then, of course, Allison Smith, Professor of History from that remarkable department. Yes. That I, I couldn't agree more, That's has right. done more That's than right. any department to Absolutely. promote diversity. So let's open it up. Uh, and just for the purpose of the recording, we're, we're cutting off the recording now so that people can feel free to speak their minds without it coming back on them on video. <laughs>